Atenção, deixa eu fechar a porta aqui. Brandini. Uh, e uh, na nossa última sessão, nós temos três apresentações uh, também relevantes e depois nós vamos para a sessão de fechamento. Né? Então, agora, aqui nessa sessão, uh, a primeira palestra vai ser feita pelo professor Júlio Meneghini e ele coordena um enorme projeto financiado pela FAPESP e pela Shell, sobre captura de carbono utilizando o pré-sal, que, obviamente, é uma questão extremamente relevante para, no assunto da geoengenharia. Então, Júlio. Paulo, muito obrigado. Obrigado pelo convite aí para fazer a apresentação. Apresentação, acho que eu posso... Será que mudar aqui com o... Tem alguma coisa para mudar, não é? Será que... Ah, acho que ele está chegando aqui. Não, acho que pode mudar. Você quer que eu faça um sinal e... Ah, tá. Faço em inglês, português. Oh, thank you. We found it. <risos> ah, tá. Bom, muito obrigado. Uh, eu vou fazer a apresentação. Não é? Logicamente, como o Paulo disse, eu estou coordenando um centro de pesquisa, o Central Research Center for Gas Innovation. E o objetivo principal do centro é a questão, as transparências, os slides estão em inglês, né? é a questão de você mitigar emissões de gases de efeito estufa, CO2 em particular, e investigar aí o uso sustentável de gás natural, biogás, hidrogênio e abatimento de emissões de CO2 em in, uh, geral. Né? Uh, e, obviamente, como todo o centro da FAPESP que segue esse modelo que nós chamamos de CEPID, Centro de pesquisa, inovação e difusão do conhecimento, nós temos esses três pilares, né? inovação, disseminação do conhecimento e pesquisa. Né? O, o, a principal motivação do nosso centro, e aí nós vamos chegar na parte CCS em breve, é tentar fazer com que a matriz energética mundial nós consigamos ter, mitigar emissões de gases de efeito estufa e, com isso, alcançarmos aqueles limites aí da questão de mudança climática, que vocês sabem melhor do que eu, é o, esse, esse grande desafio desse século, que é enfrentar a, aqueles limites de, de aumento de temperatura em relação a, ao período pré-revolução industrial. E aí eu só mostrei para vocês aí nessa, nesse slide a questão da... Uh, da matriz energética mundial, daquilo que é esperado para 2020, a do Brasil. Então, a do Brasil tem alguns pontos interessantes, né? que nós vemos aqui que a participação do carvão no Brasil é muito menor do que a participação uh, do carvão na matriz energética mundial. Uma outra coisa que no Brasil nós temos a questão de biomassa e uh, é muito maior do que a mundial, só que, a questão do óleo, nós temos um percentual muito similar à, à matriz energética mundial. E o gás natural no Brasil pode crescer, pode crescer não competindo com a questão de biomassa, de renováveis, mas nós acreditamos, aí, entrando na parcela aqui de óleo e gás e carvão, de forma a tornar ainda mais verde a matriz energética brasileira. Né? O nosso centro começou aí com a questão aí do financiamento da Shell, e nós temos uma preocupação especial, que é a questão do pré-sal. O pré-sal, a produção brasileira tem aumentado 
é, nos últimos anos aí de uma forma é, assim bem elevada, né? Se vocês considerarem o produto nacional uh, bruto aqui do Brasil, PIB, a, a, a questão de óleo e gás agora representa um pouco abaixo de 14% do PIB do Brasil. E esse número tende a crescer. E no pré-sal nós temos alguns desafios. E alguns deles são interessantes, porque nós temos o óleo de altíssima qualidade, só que com alto conteúdo de gás associado. E o que, que esse alto conteúdo de gás associado para nós é interessante? Porque, como eu disse para vocês, aí mostrei na matriz anterior, nós queremos aumentar a participação do gás e diminuir a de óleo e de carvão no Brasil. Então, esse gás vem a ser extremamente bem-vindo. E, além disso, nós temos formações geológicas, que eu vou mostrar daqui a pouco, que são extremamente propícias para que façamos captura de carbono e nós uh, mantermos lá o carbono estocado para sempre em cavernas no pré-sal. E, além disso, para completar, nós podemos chegar naquilo lá que é chamado uh, uh, Clean Energy from Fossil Fuels, que é utilizar o gás para produzir eletricidade e fazer a captura on-site uh, do, do, do CO2 resultante aí da combustão do, do sal. Aí é uma, um caso típico de uma plataforma, né? E, então, o nosso centro, acho que a ideia principal aí é o gás natural integrado a renováveis, no caso aí solar e óleo, que eu mostrei, o caso de térmicas, até está com uma cor um pouco mais vermelha, porque a questão de CCS também para captura de CO2 originário aí da, da produção em termoelétricas é alguma coisa que talvez no Brasil se torne... Uh, uh, muito interessante do ponto de vista financeiro. Agora, só entrando na parte da Shell, né, o, que, que, no, o que, que eu estou mostrando? Aí, os cenários uh, da Shell, os três cenários que a Shell tem utilizado até 2100, uh, eu vou me ater um pouco mais nesse cenário, o Sky uh, cenário, que implicaria numa um aumento da temperatura inferior a 2 graus centígrados, os outros dois cenários, a temperatura até 2100 ficaria acima daquele limite pré-revolução industrial. E o que é interessante nesse outro gráfico, aqui é a temperatura ao longo do tempo. Aqui vocês veem a temperatura, aqui é pré-revolução industrial, em relação àquilo que a temperatura média anterior à Revolução Industrial. Aqui a energia per capita, em gigajoules por habitante, de cada, por exemplo, o americano tem um consumo atual, aqui se pegar nos 2020, acima de 300 gigajoules por ano, per capita. Se pegarmos a Europa, um consumo pela metade, e o grande problema, eu não digo que é o grande problema, mas é, o grande desafio é fazer com que o, o mundo inteiro as demandas, principalmente da China e de outros países da, do Pacífico e da Ásia que estão crescendo, a, a demanda por energia média no mundo vai crescer e até 2100 acredita-se aí que tenhamos que chegar numa média de 100 gigajoules por ano por pessoa. Né? E para alcançar isso acaba sendo aquela questão do dilema. Né? Precisamos produzir mais energia e precisamos... Uh, lidar com as mudanças climáticas. A Shell uh, tem um gráfico muito interessante que relaciona aqui, para você chegar naquele cenário sky que vai implicar numa, um aumento da temperatura abaixo de 2 graus, você vai ter que ter um fo uma forte liderança e, além disso, mecanismos para compartilhar interesses comuns. Então, você vai ter que otimizar... Essas duas questões que, a nível mundial, nós sabemos o quão difícil é, e vejam os, uh, a questão da presidência dos Estados Unidos, atualmente, que não incentiva, o incentivo é apenas marginal no que diz respeito à mudança climática. Né? Eu, eu, eu estou sendo otimista, falando marginal, né? uh, porque, efetivamente, não tem muito incentivo atualmente. Os outros cenários envolveriam, uh, por exemplo, se você... Aquele, o Oceans, que é um dos cenários com uma temperatura maior do que 2 graus centígrados, envolve 
um alto índice de uh, mecanismos para compartilhar com, uh, interesses comuns, mas uma baixa liderança. E aqui o Mountains, uma elevada uh, liderança, mas uh, mecanismos para a questão aí de compartilhar interesses comuns baixo. Né? E aqui nós temos, aí nos no cenários da Shell, o que, que ficaria em termos de emissões de CO2? Gigatons per year de cada um dos cenários. Né? Então, vocês veem aqui que, para nós chegarmos a esse cenário Sky, além dessas condições aqui, nós vamos ter que passar a ter, por volta de 2070, uh, emissões negativas de CO2. Né? E emissões negativas de CO2, uma coisa chamada BEX, que é Bio Energy Carbon Capture and Storage, and Carbon Capture and Storage and Usage, vão fazer um papel fundamental, como eu vou mostrar, e o Brasil pode ser um dos países que no mundo terão, aí, através da produção de etanol e a captura de CO2, emissões negativas. Né? E aí são os cenários em termos da matriz energética que a Shell vê, uh, pra, chegando até 2070, qual que seria a, a parcela de cada um dos combustíveis. Né? Vocês podem ver aqui que ainda temos algumas áreas, por exemplo, a engenharia, a parte aeronáutica, né? a aviação, que envolveria ainda continuando, nós vamos continuar aí por um período muito longo aí, a ter o uso de, de, de combustível fóssil. Né? Mas agora vamos entrar o que, que o nosso centro tem trabalhado, e eu vou pegar três projetos em particular. Né? O, como o professor Paulo Artacho disse, né? o nosso centro é patrocinado pela FAPESP, Shell, Universidade de São Paulo, existem outros participantes, o total de investimento atual para os próximos cinco anos é por volta de 200 milhões de reais e estão divididos em 46 projetos. Né? Aqui está a parcela de cada um, a FAPESP começou com 28 milhões de reais, mas a grande parcela de investimento agora vem da Shell, está por volta de 150 milhões de reais. Isto e isto é recursos financeiros, aqui é recursos não financeiros, contrapartida da Universidade de São Paulo. As instituições parceiras, né? além da Universidade de São Paulo, FAPESP e Shell, nós temos o Instituto de Pesquisas em Energia Nuclear no Estado de São Paulo, a Universidade Federal de São Paulo, a Universidade Federal de São Carlos, Sustainable Gas Institute, que é localizado no Imperial College, é sediado no Imperial College, Escola de Engenharia Mauá, a ANP e a Secretaria de Energia do Estado de São Paulo. Atualmente, nós temos cinco programas, 46 projetos e mais de 350 pesquisadores nesses 45 projetos. Temos um programa de engenharia com 10 projetos, físico-química, 10 projetos, uh, uh, política energética e economia, uh, 8 projetos, e esse que é o maior de todos os programas, com 16 projetos, que é exatamente o, o, o programa de CO2 Abate. E temos um novo agora programa de geofísica com um único projeto, uh, Chosen Projects, que eu vou mostrar para vocês aqueles uh, uh, três projetos que eu acho mais importantes. Eu resolvi começar com a questão de Methane Sleep, e não estava na lista, mas... Foi publicado, acho que na semana passada, ou retrasada, na Science, um artigo sobre o aumento, de, um aumento substancial de emissões de metano nos últimos sete anos. Inclusive, não se sabe ainda a causa, se é antropogênica ou se é decomposição de matéria orgânica em função do aumento já existente de temperatura global. E nós temos um trabalho que tem uma implicação enorme, que é você numa figurinha aqui, acho que a pessoa que preparou essa, que é a nossa pessoa de comunicação, ela explicou de uma forma bem clara o que, que uh, você consegue diminuir emissões, no caso de emissões antropogênicas, né, aquelas que causadas pelo homem, e principalmente aquela que é a grande, a grande emissão de CO2, que, de metano, que ocorrem em selos Uh, em vedações de compressores, de instalações petroquímicas e tudo que envolve gás natural, ou CH4, ou biometano. E você tem 
uh, eu diria que praticamente 100%, quase que 100%, usam uh, selos convencionais. O que nós desenvolvemos em um dos projetos, é utilizando topology optimization, otimização topológica, é você chegar a projetos de selos que têm uma geometria que não é nem um pouco intuitiva, mas é muito orgânica, inclusive. E, e essa geometria ela tem como objetivo aumentar a vorticidade naquele gap, de forma a aumentar a perda de carga e evitar emissão. Então, o que tem aí, o que a Shell, inclusive, nos mostrou, é que, através desses selos labirínticos, talvez, eventualmente, se todos os selos fossem, as, os compressores tivessem um uh, retrofitting e utilizassem esse tipo de vedação, esse tipo de selo, você conseguiria chegar à diminuição de 50% das emissões fugitivas de metano no mundo. É um número incrível. Esses são dados, esses 50% dados da Shell na Holanda, né? em função dos nossos resultados. Um outro projeto que é extremamente importante para a parte de CCS é a questão de separação de gases. Né? Você separar o CO2 e o metano, e para você fazer a injeção, a captura e a, a estocagem do CO2, ele precisa, de acordo com as convenções uh, atuais, mundiais, a convenção de Londres, aí, o CO2 tem que ser praticamente puro, tem que ter um índice de pureza muito grande e, normalmente, ele vem associado com outros gases. No caso, por exemplo, do pré-sal, nós temos uh, o gás associado, ele pode chegar em alguns poços a ter mais do que 50% de CO2. Então, o metano, propriamente dito, que é o principal constituinte do gás natural, que é utilizado para finalidades aí de geração termoelétrica, ele não chega a ter, ele tem que ter um baixíssimo índice de CO2. Então, você tem que retirar esse CO2, purificar. Então, nós estamos trabalhando agora com membranas estruturadas. E a ideia essencial de membranas estruturadas é você fazer a separação do CO2 e CH4, utilizando, por exemplo, um dos nossos projetos, é utilizando nanotubos de grafeno. É um dos projetos que tem, eu diria que, em termos de TRL, Technical Readiness Level, é ainda baixo, mas tem um potencial enorme para crescer. Nós estamos trabalhando com, com simulações uh, dinâmica molecular para otimizarmos aí o, o tamanho aí do, dos nanotubos de forma a você deixar, por exemplo, passar apenas o CO2, né? você aplicar inclusive campos elétricos para alinhar as moléculas do CO2, ela passar pelo nanotubo e o CH4 ficar uh, retido. Né? Então é um dos projetos aqui que nós também temos aí com um grande, uma grande aceitação, uma grande, um grande impacto. Né? Eu, a, a Shell e a comunidade têm visto com muito bons olhos essa questão da, da utilização de nanotubos de carbono. Porque você, em relação ao material cerâmico convencional para separação, com o nanotubo de carbono você tem uma perda de carga mínima quando você faz com que a mistura tente ultrapassar o CO2 apenas uh, passar aí pela membrana, você conseguiria aí uma energia, uma questão uh, de energia gasta e com o processo de separação muito baixa. Né? Agora eu vou entrar na parte de carbon capture utilization and storage. Em particular, esse é o, é o projeto que, é, que tem um maior impacto, que é o projeto 34 do nosso centro. Na página do nosso centro tem a lista com, abs, com os resumos, os abstracts de cada um dos 46 projetos. Né? Então, esse daqui é um projeto em que uh, a questão do pré-sal, o que, que nós temos no pré-sal que é interessantíssimo? Aqui são as diferentes, uh, na, na costa brasileira, e na Bacia de Santos, as diferentes, os diferentes perfis. Né? Eu vou me ater a um deles, em que nós temos uma lâmina d'água por volta de 2.500 metros, depois nós temos uma camada de rocha e os reservatórios daquilo que é chamado de pós-sal, por volta de 1.000 a 1.500 metros, uma camada enorme de sal, de alita quase pura, é praticamente pura a alita, que nós temos na camada, e os grandes reservatórios daquilo que é chamado pré-sal. É chamado pré-sal, mas 
é interessante que o pessoal de literatura inglesa acha que nós deveríamos ter chamado de subsalt layer, né? mas chamamos de pré-sal e ficou mundialmente conhecido como pré-sal. Mas, na verdade, é embaixo da camada de sal, subsalt layer. Né? E aqui estão os grandes reservatórios com óleo de altíssima qualidade. Para vocês terem uma ideia, o Brasil tem produzido por volta de 3,6 milhões de barris por dia de óleo equivalente, né, incluindo a parte de gás. O pré-sal já representa mais do que 50% da produção total brasileira e tende a aumentar. A bacia de Campos, que é o pós-sal, que é aquela região em que você encontra o sal aqui mais próximo do, do leito oceânico, uh, está decaindo, enquanto no pré-sal está aumentando. Né? E o que, que nós temos de interessante aí? Aqui é só uma vista lateral, não é uma perspectiva, não é um corte, né? o pré-sal está aqui, e aqui é essa camada enorme de sal, em que nós agora vamos começar a fazer um dos projetos que talvez ainda está numa fase, talvez, de ser aprovado uma planta piloto, uma caverna piloto, em que na alita, na camada de sal, nós faríamos, através do processo de leaching, a construção de uma caverna enorme, quando eu digo caverna enorme, é uma caverna que pode chegar a 470 metros. Esse desenho é só, é, é um desenho, é só para mostrar como é que é, mas logicamente não está em escala. Né? Você injetaria água sob pressão, a, a salmoura, o brine, seria retirado e vai ter que haver o descarte em algum lugar do oceano onde você tem uma corrente elevada para que não cause dano ao meio ambiente. E uma única caverna, esse que é o um número in incrível, né? uma caverna dessas pode chegar até a um ano e meio, a dois, para você tê-la construída. Mas uma única caverna com essas dimensões poderia uh, uh, armazenar 8 milhões de toneladas, uh, toneladas de CO2. 8 milhões de toneladas de CO2 numa única caverna é muita coisa. Né? E, e uma outra coisa que é, nós temos aí, depois de construída a caverna, o que é interessante é que você pode começar a injetar o CO2 mais o CH4. Você não precisa separar o CO2 e o CH4, você pode injetar os dois, eliminar o brine até que você chegaria numa condição em que você teria a mistura CO2 e CH4, o brine, que é a salmoura, né? e o que, que espera-se passado alguns meses depois de interromper a, a injeção? Que o próprio CO2 e o CH4 separem-se por uma questão meramente gravimétrica. Os dois, para as condições do pré-sal, nós estamos falando... Uh, pressões acima de 400 bar, acima de 400 atmosferas e temperaturas por volta de 40, 50 graus centígrados, nessas condições, tanto o CO2 como o metano estão em estado supercrítico. Em estado supercrítico, o metano tem uma densidade, uma massa específica por volta de 250 kg por metro cúbico e o CO2, 920 kg por metro cúbico. Então, eles se separariam, uma questão gravimétrica, e aí você poderia utilizar apenas o CH4, por exemplo, para turbinas que ficariam nas plataformas, que gerariam eletricidade para todas as plataformas do entorno, exportariam para a, a costa a eletricidade e você injetaria o CO2 até que todo o CH4 tivesse consumido e a caverna estivesse apenas com CO2. E aí, a partir daí, você faria o selo, o selo, o, o selo e aquele CO2 ficaria retido lá forever. Se você tiver os 450 metros, considerar que você tem regiões, inclusive com 2 mil metros de camada de sal, você uh, teria, uma, uma, mesmo no caso de um terremoto ou uma condição aí extrema do ponto de vista geológico, aquele CO2 manteria-se contido no meio daquela camada de sal. Então, essa é a, é a, aqui é um desenho que mostra exatamente a, a, a caverna completamente com CO2, aqui o CO2 e o metano, e todo o sistema, 
e acredita se nós você logicamente teria aí uma um consumo de 10 a 20% da potência que seria gerada com a combustão eficiente desse CH4, você teria que gastar com a injeção do CO2 na caverna. Mas você conseguiria, aí, num limite, aí, obter clean energy from fossil fuels e exportar através de cabos para a costa, que, do ponto de vista de licença ambiental, é muito mais fácil do que você ter o gás sendo transportado para a costa. Se você pegar nessa profundidade, 2.500 metros, 300 quilômetros da costa, você ter um gasoduto é como se fosse atravessar os Alpes, porque você parte de uma profundidade aí quase 3 mil metros e tem que chegar a zero na costa e 300 quilômetros de distância. Né? Então, at através aí da, do, 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 você transportaria, exportaria uh, eletricidade. Né? O conceito gas to wire, né? GTY. E agora, uma nova proposta, que acho que tem um, é a última parte que eu vou apresentar agora, que é aquela questão de você fazer a captura do CO2 originário aí da produção de etanol. E nós estamos também estudando essa possibilidade e mapeando no estado de São Paulo, Mato Grosso do Sul e Paraná, eventuais locais para você fazer a injeção de CO2 resultante, da, por exemplo, do processo de fermentação uh, para a produção do etanol. Aqui a parte interessante é a, que é a emissão de CO2, é um CO2 quase que puro. Né? Então você não tem que, uh, você tem que capturar, mas não fazer a purificação dele. Né? Aí você poderia seguir uma rota de storage, de armazenamento, uma rota utilizando esse CO2 quase puro e eletricidade vinda de outras fontes para produzir combustível sintético, líquido, com CO2 e elétrons. Eletricidade você poderia utilizar e criar combustíveis sintéticos. Nós temos dois projetos aí estudando catalisadores para a produção de combustíveis sintéticos, né? utilização. E com esse processo todo, poucas pessoas sabem, que se você fizer a captura do CO2 no processo de fermentação e tirar o diesel da produção de etanol no Brasil, você fala, poxa, mas onde que se utiliza diesel na produção de etanol? Todas as máquinas colhedeiras, todas as máquinas de plantio são movidas a diesel. E o transporte do etanol é feito com caminhões movidos a diesel. Se você tirar o diesel dessa equação e utilizar biogás ou biometano produzido também a partir da produção de etanol, utilizando o resíduo sólido e líquido, a vinhaça principalmente, a vinhaça é o resíduo líquido originário da produção de etanol e pouca gente sabe também que para cada litro de etanol você produz de 10 a 12 litros de vinhaça. Então você tem um... Você é uma, você produzir biogás e reduzir essa quantidade de vinhaça que tem que ser é utilizada para irrigação ou, ou é armazenada em, em grandes é, reservatórios, você diminuiria e faria com que o biometano passasse a mover a frota de caminhões de transporte e as máquinas colhedeiras. Se você fizer isso e a captura na fermentação, o etanol brasileiro pode ter uma pegada de emissões de hidrogênio ligeiramente negativa. O quão negativa é vai depender da eficiência dos processos. E dessa questão principal aqui, da, se você conseguiu, através de fontes uh, renováveis, em particular solar e eólica, você tiver uma, um, ex, um excedente aí para que faça essa conversão para produzir uh, combustível sintético a partir do CO2. E aí é o sonho, de, é o sonho acho que tanto dos, daqueles que trabalham com o meio ambiente, como aqueles que trabalham com energia. Você andar com um carro movido a etanol e pensar que você vai estar ajudando a capturar CO2, vai ser uma coisa maravilhosa. Né? Eu espero que daqui 5 a 10 anos nós tenhamos isso no Brasil sendo feito. Né? 
E aí tem um impacto enorme, né? porque você muda o paradigma e aí vai ser difícil criticar o etanol brasileiro. Quando eu falo o etanol brasileiro, não é só o brasileiro, não, porque também uh, Bex está uh, sendo pensado também nos Estados Unidos, inclusive pela Shell. Nos Estados Unidos existe agora um movimento muito grande uh, uh, na, com as, os produtores de etanol para que se uh, desenvolva essa tecnologia. Então era isso que eu gostaria de apresentar. Então, eu agradeço mais uma vez o Paulo aí pelo convite. Obrigado. Questões, comentários? When you make the cave with CO2 and methane, and then you burn the methane to make money, do you capture the CO2 from that? is to capture the CO2. And I believe that uh, one of the few regions in the world where this is, uh, uh, economically speaking, feasible is the pre-salt, because they are already injecting the associated gas at very high pressures uh, for, uh, for EOR, for enhanced oil recovery. And then instead of injecting in those very deep reservoirs the uh, mixture of CO2 and methane, you would burn the methane, and then you would inject part of the CO2 in the reservoir, and part you would live forever in those caves. And then we would do CCS. And why um, that condition is very good, that uh, the pre-salt is very good because the salt layer is located in a depth in which the pressure is very high and then co2 becomes super critical and then you have a high density and then you can store up to i don't know 10 million tons in a single cave and then you would reduce the co2 footprint in general mais alguma pergunta Sim, muito obrigado pela excelente apresentação, muita, muita coisa nova para mim, digamos, realmente fantástica. Eu pediria, é um quadro muito otimista, digamos, tá? mas assim, enfim, digamos, você está, está estudando, está, tem um centro importantíssimo, financiado, tudo. É algo realmente, neste momento, para a ciência brasileira, muito positivo. Agora, minha pergunta é, você poderia situar um pouco em contexto internacional, ou seja, com, que, em que outros países, como está o estado de pesquisas similares em outros países chave, tipo Estados Unidos, Canadá, digamos, ou seja... É... Canadá é um dos que eu ia... Eu vou citar o Canadá, é um... Eu vou, antes de citar o Canadá, a Austrália e o Japão. O Japão, na ilha de Sapporo, ele, em Sapporo, ele já tem uma planta de, que faz carbon capture and storage, uh, de, uh, o, o CO2 não é originário da queima de, de metano, mas é originário da produção de hidrogênio através de reforma de metano que produz hidrogênio e CO2. Então, eles capturam já há mais de 10 anos, é o, é o projeto... É a planta de Tomacomai, Tomacomai que é na, em, próximo de Sapporo, da cidade de Sapporo e na ilha, naquela ilha ao norte, no Japão. Hokkaido. 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 E Sapporo é a cidade, próximo. É, desculpa, a ilha não é Sapporo, é Hokkaido, é a ilha e Sapporo é a cidade. Em Tomacomai, eu não tenho aqui os números, mas é captura por volta, eles capturaram por volta de 100 mil toneladas. Em, reserva em formações rochosas offshore, abaixo do leito marinho. E esse projeto foi um projeto piloto, para eles, inclusive, monitorarem eventuais vazamentos de CO2 no entorno. Eles estão injetando informações rochosas. Na Austrália, aproximadamente uma hora de Melbourne, existe um outro projeto que era um campo de produção de gás 
natural onshore, em que eles também estão fazendo uh, na é o Australian CCS Project, se não me engano. Aí o, o número é um pouco maior, chegaram acho que a 200 mil toneladas. Nos Estados Unidos agora tem a maior, o maior projeto, e por um acaso é a Shell, em Alberta, no Canadá, desculpa, não nos Estados Unidos, no Canadá, em Alberta, e eles, a previsão é estocar um milhão de toneladas de CO2 por ano, e aí é, da, é originário esse CO2 do processo de produção de shale oil. Né? Então, é, é um dos pontos que é ninguém quer, isso eu nem toquei na questão de percepção pública, porque você falar em capturar CO2 e ninguém quer ter CO2 sendo estocado no seu quintal. Né? Uh, em Alberta é fácil convencer, porque eles estão produzindo shale oil, né? que uh, é, é mais crítico ainda, do, eu acho que é, é mais passível de crítica do que a produção de shale gas. Né? Uh, no Brasil tem uma certa vantagem, porque estamos a 300 quilômetros da costa, e numa região extremamente segura do ponto de vista geológico. Então, por isso que nós acreditamos que esse projeto ele é o único nesse estágio, só que existem outros lugares no mundo, inclusive no Golfo do México, em que você poderia aplicá-lo. Então, o interesse, por exemplo, da Shell, não é apenas a região do pré-sal, mas também eventuais locais no mundo fora o Brasil. Provavelmente seria algo similar também. Eu acho que não tenho dúvida, devido à formação, assim como espera-se ter petróleo em profundidades, como nós temos no pré-sal, espera-se que na, na costa uh, ocidental da, da África também seja similar. E você teria as mesmas condições. Né? Okay. Obrigado, Júlio, Obrigado. pela ótima apresentação. E agora nós vamos discutir é, projetos de é, modelagem de geoengenharia em países em desenvolvimento que o Andy Parker está coordenando. Thank you, thanks, Paula. Super stuff. So um, this morning we had some terrific conversations as you remember, about, about governance, and particularly about the many significant challenges that governance of SRM um, represents. Now we're going to move to look at things that people are doing to try and address some of those challenges, or at least to start chipping away at them. Um, I'm going to talk uh, first, then we've got Kai next. We, we work for different projects who are trying to do something about the tricky governance challenges. I'm the director and I've been the main architect for the last nine years for a project which is called the SRM Governance Initiative. There we are, SRMGI down the bottom there. And um, we seek to build the capacity of developing countries to evaluate solar geoengineering, so to make their own minds up about uh, whether they think it's a good or a bad idea, about what it will mean for them locally. Um, and this project fit, fits in well with some other efforts to address the governance challenges. Um, C2G project, for which Kai works, he'll tell you more about it. They're looking at international institutions, trying to bring this to the attention of some of the international institutions we heard about this morning. Elsewhere, people are working on um, the technical aspects of governance. So at the University of Calgary, there's a great project, uh, a code of conduct for research, thinking about all the difficult procedural aspects of who gets to do what and when. Um, uh, similar to that, the Forum for Climate Engineering Assessment, FCEA, they had a working group report on the technical aspects. So all of these projects are, are working, trying to chip away at the governance challenges. Um, I need the clicker. But yeah, we, we do our work with developing countries. We've worked since um, 2011 on this work. And um, the reason we do our work was perhaps summed up no better place than in the conclusion of this commentary. This was published in Nature uh, last April. Uh, Paulo Artacho was one of the co-authors on this, as was I. 
And, and here's the conclusion, Atik Rahman from Bangladesh, who you may know, he was the lead author. Um, we finished. Solar geoengineering is fraught with risks, and it can never be an alternative to mitigation. But it's unclear whether the risks of solar geoengineering are greater than the risks of breaking the 1.5C warming target. As things stand, politicians will face this dismal dilemma within a couple of decades. It is right, politically and morally, for the Global South to have a central role in, uh, in solar geoengineering research, discussion, and evaluation. And this sums up why we do our work at SRMGI. Um, to date, most engagement with solar geoengineering has come from OECD countries. So there is a research program in China but aside from that, most research efforts have been in Europe, have been in North America, um, some in Japan. And, and that means that experts from these countries have dominated the debate so far. So they have written the most books, uh, the most academic papers. It's experts from America and Europe who are quoted in the newspapers. And this is perhaps not surprising. Novel issues of science and technology tend to develop in the countries with the largest science budgets. But while it's not surprising, it's not desirable. Um, this is a global issue, and it's going to need a global, an informed global conversation uh, if we're to be able to manage it. So the last sentence, yeah, politically and morally correct for the global south to have a central role. Well, why, from a moral standpoint, it's correct for the world's most climate vulnerable countries to be leading on SRM evaluation, simply because SRM means more to the global south. Uh, the climate vulnerable countries of the developing world are typically uh, least resilient to environmental change. And, and so that means if SRM works really well and can reduce climate risk, they've got the most to gain. Whereas if SRM goes wrong in some of the ways we've heard in the last day and a half, then it's the developing countries who will be on the front lines. It makes sense politically for developing countries to lead on the evaluation um, in that the more that the world's uh, poorest countries understand SRM, they understand its local implications, what it means for their climate, the better place they are, they are to stand up for their own interests when it comes to international negotiations. The better place they will be to stand up to snake oil salesmen who come to international negotiations to tell them either that SRM offers nothing but risk or that SRM is the solution to climate change. Um, also, developing countries, this is often forgotten, but developing countries have been policy innovators um, at many stages in the last 20 years with climate change. So the 1.5C warming target, uh, thinking about adaptation alongside mitigation, uh, these were major climate policy innovations that came from the, came from the global south. And I'd also ask you to think about how SRM may play out if it's proposed for use in, say, 20, 20 years. Let's think of two worlds. In one world, things have continued to develop like they have for the last decade. And you've got maybe a dozen OECD countries who know a lot about geoengineering. They've done a lot of research. But the rest of the world has really not been invited to the party. They don't know a lot about it. In that world, how, would, how difficult would it be to come to a representative, equitable decision about whether to use SRM, whether it's a good or a bad idea for the global south. And, and, and then we imagine another world, the world that we're trying to build with our work, where the majority of the world's countries understand SRM. They've done their own research. They understand what it means for their local climate, for their agriculture, for extreme weather. I think in that latter world, it doesn't make it easy to come to an agreement about SRM, but it does increase the chances of being able to have a sensible discussion that's informed by evidence. So we think there are strong, strong arguments in favor of building the capacity of the Global South to evaluate SRM. Um, unfortunately, a laissez-faire attitude to the development will mean that the countries of the Global North will continue to get further and further away in terms of research, discussion, conversation. Uh, and that's something that we at the SRM Governance Initiative have been working to address for years alongside a large group of friends and colleagues from all around the world, including uh, Paolo and uh, Eduardo, who've been involved for the last nine years. I will tell you about the work that we do. 
So SRMGI is an international NGO-driven project. It was uh, launched in 2010 uh, by the Royal Society, where I used to work in the UK, by Environmental Defense Fund, the Green NGO in the United States, and by TWAS, who are the World Academy of Sciences, uh, the Academy of Sciences for the Developing World. Uh, we seek to build the capacity of developing countries and emerging economies. When I use the word developing countries, I'm using it in the broadest possible sense, the, the sense that the IMF uses it. Um, this really in includes all countries that should be part of the conversation on uh, geoengineering but haven't been so far. So that's, that's most of the countries of the planet. Um, we have, uh, you can see along the, the, our staff are along the bottom there. We have three co-chairs representing uh, TWAS and EDF and then John Shepard, uh, who initially represented the Royal Society. But everything that we've done has been done with a staff of two or fewer. We finally got three staff in November uh, and there was much rejoicing. Uh, but we've punched above our weight. Everything I'm going to tell you about, we've done with a, a small staff but a large group of friends. And what we do is to try and build capacity through two approaches. One is we hold uh, workshops in developing countries to start a conversation and to start a critical conversation. We are neutral on the issue of SRM. We are neither uh, in the business of telling people it would be a good idea or telling people it would be a really bad idea. It's too early to tell. So we run these workshops in the Global South, and we recently added uh, a new arm of work. We now fund research through our, through our decimals fund, which I will come to. Our workshops were, in 2011, we wanted to start working with developing countries to start building capacity, but we didn't know how. It wasn't an immediate pathway to do any of this work. This is entrepreneurial. No one ever came to us and said, can you please build developing country capacity? We're doing this because we think it would be a useful thing to do with our partners. And so using whatever resources we had, which in the beginning was zero resources, we started to work, run these engagement workshops. I was going on holiday in Pakistan, going to visit a friend. He worked for a development NGO. And so we ran a workshop there. We invited, like the workshop here, we invited people from the local climate community. And we wanted to talk about geoengineering. What do you guys think will happen in Pakistan if this technology is developed? What happens if India develops the technology? And we found it was a great conversation. And so we started to run engagement workshops wherever we were able to. And here's the full list of different places we visited. I think it's roughly 17 workshops in 14 different countries. They're always done with the same ethos, with the same method. So we work with local partners, invaluable working with local partners. When we came here to Brazil in 2016, we uh, ran a meeting in San Jose dos Campos, working with IMPI as the local partner. Uh, we always feature the local climate community in prominent speaking roles. The goal is always the same, to start a critical discussion about what SRM means for the local region, for Brazil or for South Asia or for wherever we're visiting. These workshops were a good start, but they were a modest start. Um, we learned a lot from them. We learned that there was a high degree of interest all around the world for there to be a larger conversation about geoengineering, about what it means. People were keen to be involved from the beginning. Um, it was clear, and, and this, this stuff is obvious, but it was useful to, to experience it. It was, it was clear that people wanted their own policymakers and negotiators to be informed by their own scientists. So when this issue comes up for discussion in Brazil, the people at the workshop said they wanted Brazilian experts to have done the, done the research and inform their own policymakers. And that's a response we got from, from Brazil to Bangladesh. And so, I can put a picture up, I think. So these workshops, while they were a crucial first step, after six or seven years of doing them, um, we'd learned some important lessons. They're a great first step, but they're insufficient for building sustainable expertise, for building capacity. Um, put simply, workshops do not build uh, expertise. You need To build expertise, you need sustained engagement over a number of years. You need to research, you need to read, you need to debate with colleagues and argue, you need to go to workshops and so on. And one thing became clear, if we wanted to establish that level of engagement, then we needed to respond to the requests we were getting in these workshops, and we needed to start, if we could, start a geoengineering 
research fund for the developing world. That's something that they'd been called for wherever we had done our work. And so it was clear. We needed to set up this research program, and we set about doing it. The difficult thing about setting up uh, a research program from scratch is that it's really hard, uh, starting from nowhere. I can show you exactly how hard it is to set up a research program from scratch. Uh, that's me in 2016 at the Brazil, Brazil workshop. Not a gray hair on my face. And now, three, after three years of working to try and to set up decimals, um, this is one of the more shocking images you'll see in the world of solar geoengineering. Uh, it's one of the prices. But um, uh, we managed it. So, so we worked with our partners around the world. We got a huge amount of community input. Uh, Paolo and I had, had several phone calls talking about how can we set up a research program? That, you know, how, how would it work in Brazil? How much do you have to pay researchers to be able to model SRM? And I did the same with Rodel Lasco in the Philippines uh, and colleagues at the African Academy of Sciences in Kenya. And so uh, eventually we were able to put this all together and design the Decimals Fund. And that stands for uh, Developing Country Impact Modeling Analysis for SRM, the Decimals Fund. And this, this was launched last year. Uh, with a call for proposals. Um, we had numerous design constraints. How do you uh, design a research program where all the projects can be completed in 2.5 years? There was no point us designing a research program if it was going to take three or four years to run the research because we did not have funding for three or four years. Our funders, the Open Philanthropy Project, they, they saw our vision, but the, our, our current funding takes us only, only through to the end of 2020. So we needed projects that could be completed in two, two, two to two and a half years. Um, we wanted projects that were scientifically useful, so not just busy work. We, we had to make sure that the projects we funded were going to produce science of lasting value to be able to inform further discussions in their region so that the scientists could establish their place at global geoengineering conferences. Um, how would they get access to the data? We, for instance, we could not design a research program that required supercomputer access. That would have restricted the number of countries that were able to apply, and it would have made each grant way larger than we could afford. Um, and also, we wanted to build the capacity of young scientists. This is something I was advised, I think uh, maybe even Paolo suggested this, is that we couldn't design a research program where all the money just went to senior professors, people who'd already established themselves as world experts. We need to bring the next generation through. So uh, postdocs, junior professors, they can start working on this. In 20 years, they'll be the ones advising their governments and their regions on whether this is a really bad or a potentially useful I idea. And so the decimals design. We now offer grants of up to 70,000 US dollars. Uh, these are administered by TWAS, who I mentioned earlier, the World Academy of Sciences. They already give out over a million dollars per year of grants to scientists and research groups across the global south. Um, the grants are for modeling the local impacts of SRM. So, so looking at hydrology, looking at the impacts on storms. We didn't uh, tell the research groups what to propose. We left it up to, uh, up to applicants to say what they wanted to look at. They have to do their own downscaling and bias correction um, because an expert in uh, Bangladeshi climate modeling um, is the person who knows best how to, how to downscale, how, how to do the bias correction for their local topography. And uh, all teams have to report on their results with published papers by the end of 2020. We didn't know how this was going to fly. This was, this was an idea that was suggested, but we didn't know if we were going to get a single grant application. And so we put the call for applications out last April. In the end, we got 75 applications back. And, and these were the ones that were chosen by an independent review process. So let's go through them. Well, this one you know about already. This is uh, the team that Inez is leading in the uh, University of Buenos Aires. Uh, terrific project looking at the hydrological impacts of SRM in the La Plata River Basin. In Bangladesh, um, it's a multinational team looking at SRM impacts on the spread of malaria and cholera. This is something that has never been studied before, a fascinating project. And you will spot down there uh, the famous Bangladeshi academic, Alan Robach. <laughs> um, but it's, it's a truly international team, people working at ICCD, ICDDRB, um, people from South Africa, America, uh, really looking forward to finding out their results. In Benin, West Africa, um, impacts of SRM on the West African climate. 
Indonesia, another hydrological one like the Argentinian project, the impacts on extreme temperatures and extreme precip in Indonesia. Iran, another interesting left field project. The team there is looking at storm trackings, atmospheric blockings, and severe dust storms, which are a threat ac across the whole Middle East, North African region. They're going to be modeling how SRM might affect uh, dust storms in the Middle East. No one has looked at this before. In Côte d'Ivoire, uh, temperature and precip extremes over West and Central Africa. They're also looking at the implications for river runoff and water resources. The team in Jamaica. Uh, Jamaica, of course, being a small island developing state, and the small island developing states were instrumental in climate policy in getting the 1.5C target agreed. And that's what makes this an interesting project, because uh, Leonardo Clark, uh, Michael Taylor, and the team, they're looking at two scenarios. A scenario where the Caribbean warms beyond 1.5C to 2 or 3C, and then a scenario where that temperature is held at 1.5C with the, the SRM. So they're investigating what will, be, what will happen if SRM is used to make that 1.5C temperature target. And it's going to be interesting to see what results they find. Uh, that's right, yeah. Um, uh, Alan recognizes the guy in the middle. Uh, there's a Cuban academic in the team as well. Uh, South Africa. This is based at the University of Cape Town. You will remember that in the last year, Cape Town came within a few days of running out of water. Um, an incredible situation uh, due to drought in southern Africa. They're going to see how the use of SRM could affect drought and heat extremes in southern Africa, and then how that could affect um, uh, agriculture. So, actually, I'll go back. So, uh, amongst all of these teams, we didn't gerrymander this. This was just the result of the um, independent peer review. But we've got small island developing states in Jamaica. We've got BRICS, the BRICS group in the form of South Africa. We've got two of the world's least developed countries uh, in Bangladesh and Benin. They're both LDCs, even though Bangladesh graduate soon. And almost all developing regions are represented. So from Southeast Asia, South Asia, the Middle East, South America, Africa. Uh, there are 45 scientists of which there are nine IPCC authors. Um, Inez is leading what I believe is the first majority female SRM modeling project, which is, uh, which is terrific, that came through decimals. And our researchers a really wide range from a, a young Bangladeshi master's student right through to uh, Rita Colwell, who, who's, there we go, she's the lady fourth on the left, who's the former director of the um, National Science Foundation, the NSF, in the United States. So an enormous range of scientists working on decimals. To assist the teams, help them get their work done well and accurately and reported within two years, we have uh, a stellar list of SRM modeling experts who are giving their time for free to work with the team. So they're all working with uh, as voluntary collaborators with these teams. Um, you can read them here, but some of the world's leading experts. Alan also, as you see, is working on the Bangladesh team, so effectively in, in the same role. Uh, they're doing this because they believe in what we're doing. They believe in this work, so they're giving their time for free, and they're really interested to work with their colleagues from the Global South. It's also a two-way process, though. These guys here are experts in modeling SRM. They can help the teams understand some of the pitfalls in modeling SRM. Um, but these guys are not experts in modeling the local impacts of climate change. So they're going to learn with, from their colleagues in the Global South about how they do their work and um, hopefully start to build an international community around these projects. And yeah, that's one of the key take-homes, that science is only a part of what we were doing. If, if, if our $70,000 for each project, if all that bought was a research study, that would be good. That would be plenty. You know, it's useful to know the effects of SRM in drought in southern Africa. Um, but it would also be a missed opportunity. So um, we wanted to add as much value as possible to the decimals experience. Um, we ran a training workshop where two scientists from each team could come together um, to meet each other, to create a cohort so the people from Argentina know the guys from South Africa who know the guys from Indonesia. 
um, we provided money for computers. That was one thing that Michael Taylor, when I first consulted him, he said, this sometimes is a problem with grants, is that the grant money pays for salaries, but then there's no computers for, to, that allow people to do the work, um, particularly in the world's uh, less developed countries. Um, there's money for each team to attend conferences. We want to build a community. We want to get as much contact as possible with its existing experts. Um, and each team receives money at the end of their grant period to run a workshop to explain their results and discuss them with the local climate community. As we know, we've discussed it for a day and a half. SRM is about so much more than just science. It's the socio-political issues that are the difficult ones. So at the end of this, each team will receive money to run a workshop to talk to the local community and say, hey, this is what we found out. What do you guys think? Should there be more research? Is this the worst idea you've ever heard? Um, it's going to be interesting to see what comes out of those uh, the, those workshops. So the things we'll get from decimals, we'll obviously get great science. We've got some stellar scientists running really interesting projects. Uh, we'll get a foundation for further discussions in all of these regions. Th this is not intended to be science in a vacuum. What we want is for the local teams to lead the conversation in their regions, to lead a critical discussion about what geoengineering means for West Africa or the Middle East. Um, we'll get a broader community and all the positive knock-on effects that that has. So um, we held a large conference bringing 40 of our past participants to Berlin. Uh, and Paolo and Eduardo were there in attendance, and that was 18 months ago. And this was held in concert with the world's largest geoengineering conference, the CEC 17, it was called, Climate Engineering Conference 2017. And it made such a difference to have so many rep representatives of so many different countries at the conference. All of a sudden, there were people from the Global South on the panels. There were people from Global South making points and being invited to be speakers. And many people commented to me how different the discussions of geoengineering were when the Global South was not being used as a political football. Previously, people who are, tend to be more in favor of geoengineering invoke the plight of developing countries to support their arguments. They say, well, we've got to uh, develop this because poor countries are going to suffer if we don't. And so it goes the same in the other direction. It's like people who are against geoengineering say, well, no, you, you, can't, you can't develop this, so you're imposing it on the Global South. When you've got people in the room who understand this technology really well and who are from equatorial Africa or uh, Pacific Islands, it's really hard to make claims on their behalf, and it changed the nature of the conversation. Um, yeah, this is a, a useful one to, to move on to the, what happens next. This is, this is the modeling coverage, roughly of, of the, the eight projects I, uh, I introduced. There's the Jamaican one looking at the Caribbean region. There's uh, the Argentinian project and the La Plata River Basin, uh, Southeast Asia, Bangladesh. What this also says is how many areas that we have, le we have left untouched with this first round of modeling grants. And the one that's particularly obvious for a meeting like this is, is right here, right here. So. As things stand, no one's doing this local impact research on what SRM might mean for Amazonia, or in fact for most of South America. Um, and that leads me to next steps. So now we've established decimals, and now we've demonstrated that there is a desire to do this work. There were more great applications than we were able to fund. We planned to fund six, and the applications were so good, we moved money around to be able to fund eight projects. But there were great applications we couldn't fund, and we would love to be able to fund. So we intend to seek more money for further rounds of decimals. We intend uh, to run more workshops in all of the countries uh, where we're funding research and in more countries. We've only ever un run one workshop in Latin America, uh, which is a result of just the partnerships we've had in the past, and that was the, the one in Brazil. But I hope from this we'll get more contacts, r perchance run a meeting in Colombia. The, to my, the best of my knowledge, there hasn't been one to date. So um, we want to make more contacts. We're going to have another global forum next year, bringing people from around the world, from around the global south, together in Berlin to have their say, to meet the people researching SRM. That looks likely to happen in October. And yeah, so how does this relate to Latin America? 
Yeah, they, so, so there's, it looks likely that another large geoengineering conference will be taking place in Berlin next year, CEC, and we hope the Global Forum will be able to lo locate with that so that the experts from all around the world can meet each other for three or four days of debate, discussion, disagreement, and making plans for how you can move this stuff forward. But yeah, Latin America is enormously underrepresented in these discussions. I would say that, well, the 620 million people, of which only a few are SRM experts, a handful, and I would say almost every one of those experts is in this room right now which is incredible for a continent of 620 million people and some of the specific climate threats you get from the biodiversity of Costa Rica through the Amazon, through the hydrology of the La Plata Basin. So more partnerships are needed if you have ideas, if you have suggestions for how we might move this conversation forward in countries we've not visited, then come and find me afterwards because we're always keen to, to meet new people. Um, thank you. That's everything. Question, points? Yes, yeah, sorry, I'm a speaker, so I'm, please uh, others ask questions. But I had a clarification question. So when you talk about SRM, you are associated with solar uh, stratospheric aerosol injection or any form of SRM, like regional, um, you know, cloud brightening and things. Yeah, good question, Kai. So typically when we're, ta when we're talking about SRM, we mean stratospheric aerosols, but we're not exclusive about that. So when we ran the call for decimals, we didn't specify. It was up to the applicants to say what they wanted to study. Um, we didn't want to tell them, you'll study hydrology and stratospheric aerosols. They were, they were able to... Um, uh, they were able to apply saying what they wanted to study and, and our, uh, our reviewers, of which Alan was one, um, our reviewers uh, reviewed them on their own merit. Any other questions? So, thank you, Andy. So we go for the, our last uh, talk that will be given by Kai Schmidt. So basically, uh, he is from the Carnegie Carnage group of uh, geoengineering. So, floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. First of all, apologies. I was supposed to be here since yesterday morning, but I was busy for other things, and let's not go into the details there. Uh, but it seemed to sorting itself out. And I had to throw these uh, slides together in the last minute right now because it wasn't really sure what I was going to be able to talk about. So, bear with me. A number of the slides might not make sense. So, what like to do is I want to get, uh, explain to you what our initiative, the Carnegie Climate, um, uh, after we, Carnegie Climate Governance Initiative, and there's a cross on that too, and I will come to that in this, uh, later on in the talk. Um, first of all, who are we? Um, we are an initiative which is based in the Carnegie Council for Ethics and International Affairs, which is a New York-based um, NGO. The name says what it uh, is about. And we are uh, an initiative which is basically anchored in this, uh, in this uh, Carnegie um, outfit. It's one of the original Carnegie outfits which were created by his wealth um, and it's existing since 110 years. Um, and we are led by, uh, we are a team about, uh, by now, uh, nearly 12 individuals which are distributed uh, across the world is too far to say, but uh, we are virtual completely. And we are led um, by um, the former um, Assistant Secretary General for Climate Change in the United Nations. So not the Climate Change Convention, but in the United Nations, directly reporting to the uh, Secretary General, back then Ban Ki-moon. Uh, his name is Janusz Pastor. And my name is uh, Kaivo Barani Schmidt. I'm a Senior Program Director in, in the team. And um, uh, I had the pleasure to work on climate change since I was nine, no, not nine, but since 1995. Um, uh, and I worked in the UNFCCC um, Climate Change Secretariat until 2009 when I joined the Office of the Secretary General in New York um, for the first um, uh, climate summit which you organized back then. But so much maybe about me and, 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 uh, and our colleagues. Oh, how does this work? How do I press the... Okay, okay. so what is, what is it that we are trying to achieve? Um, we have set ourselves a mission goal which is to uh, catalyze um, the, uh, the expansion of a conversation um, and the creation of um, effective uh, governance around solar radiation modification and uh, carbon, large-scale carbon dioxide removal, collectively also referred to as geoengineering. And I'm, I had this cross in, in, in our name. We have actually decided yesterday, um, after a long process, that we, would, we, would, we don't want to use the word geoengineering when we present this issue. 
because we realized in the work we are doing, trying to get people interested into it, uh, talking about geoengineering, people have to a large extent actually preset um, reactions to it. Em either it's emotions or particular views, and it's not helpful in our current context where we actually have to bring as many people to the table to understand what it is all about and take uh, their own informed decisions about how, whether or not to use them and so forth, which is the other part of us. So we are trying to expand the conversation, uh, but we are staying impartial. And we are staying impartial to the question of the choices. Do we use SAI or not? Do we use uh, all these beautiful technologies we have seen beforehand by uh, the gentleman from Shell, I think it, uh, it was, or not? That's not our concern. What our concern is is that when we take this decision, A, we take them timely and we take them in an informed way with all actors which should be involved, involved in the right way. Um, and this is uh, fundamentally only achieved to um, um, a large uh, um, an honest conversation uh, so society-wide. And the work by, um, by Andrew is in, that, in the academic world extremely helpful because it creates a basis. So what, ah, I bring that, uh, I bring that back later. Um, uh, the background of us, as I said, so we've been, uh, the team has to be, 80% eight, has, has worked for 20 or longer years on climate change and before that on the same development or development in general. So we have been following this process for a long time. And as I was mentioning, that the core team has been involved in the organization uh, the support of the Secretary General in the uh, Paris Agreement. And back then already, okay, the focus was, of course, as it should be, in mobilizing the, uh, the action and attention to emission reductions. Because the more we reduce, the less our problem, in the two, two dimensions of the problem. Um, but the information was there. I mean, what we're talking about, the basic information, and Paolo, Paolo and others can certainly confirm that, is that AR5 in 2014 was already clear and informed the Paris Agreement. It informed about the temperature goal, which keeps us in safe space, so to say. Um, and for some countries, it means, oh, I'm sorry, and for some countries, it means um, uh, possibly being underwater. Uh, that is the uh, two degrees and then pursuing the limiting it to 1.5 degree. And, and often not used in the communication out there a lot. Um, it has there a agreement, actually in the legal part, an agreement that governments said we are going to balance remaining emissions with equivalent of removals, meaning net zero by mid-century, which is the big driver for the need for large-scale removals, if you want to achieve that or not. And then what happened last year, so our initiative is operating since 2017, I think, beginning of 17, actively, and um, we had a really hard time to get this kind of knowledge through because of this focus on emission reductions, and uh, a certain concern about that by talking about that second part, the need for balancing, you are actually undermining the effort of doing the emission reductions. And then since last year, the IPCC 1.5 report, it was, a, it was a game changer for us who are working with uh, primary targets, our governments, um, major CSO, uh, civil society organizations, international organizations, and I come to that in a second, how we are doing that. But it was critical because that report helped the governments and all these organizations to say, okay, now we can talk about it. Beforehand, it was a feeling, oh, we might be, uh, you know, marked as being uh, going away from the emission reductions agenda. Um, and, um, uh, but IPCC 1.5 did not say fundamentally much more in terms of the need, but what it provided, it provides more information about the, the risks of the different pathways. It provides uh, information about it's not, it's not going to be a single bullet anymore. It's not going to be backs only or it's not going to be whatever only. It has to be a portfolio of things which will, will happen. And most importantly, it provided in the area which us concerns as well. I mean, and we are working on both, large scale removals and SRM. It, it, uh, but there's the, the link will come. Uh, it was very clear that we need to remove carbon by mid-century in an order of magnitude we as humans have never done. In terms of how to do it, we have a few things, particularly in the, in the nature-based solution space, which uh, we know how to do, but we have never driven this, driven this to the scale, and we have never thought about what does this mean if we drive them to that scale of removal, how does this interact with the various sustainable development goals which we have set ourselves, and how are they interrelating? It doesn't mean necessarily that they're positive or negative. So, our initiative is very much um, around creating awareness, readiness to learn globally so that you share the information and you can take an informed decision together, um, and then uh, to take the informed, to cho uh, informed choices which are required. I'm oh, sorry. Um, okay. 
Yeah. Okay, well, and IPCC, say, uh, the last point, of course, which IPCC uh, 1.5 said is that SRM, they did not consider them in their scenarios uh, because of um, too much unknown risk factors and a number of things. I, I had slides with more detail, but I'm not going to go into that detail. But basically, that was the status, uh, what IPCC as a, as a process came to a conclusion. And the, 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 what, what needs to be known is, is that AR6, Six, the next assessment report will actually uh, look into this much more stronger. It will actually create pathways or look into, capture the knowledge which is out there about pathways which are uh, drawing on solar radiation modification, the various forms of that. I, I don't go into detail. You have had a number of presentations, but as I said, there are two big baskets, uh, a variety of uh, carbon dioxide removals which are nature-based, which are chemical or technical and something in between. I think BEC's uh, bioenergy carbon capture and storage, which uh, the gentleman mentioned beforehand, is, uh, one, is, is one of those which are in between the two. Um, and then we have the solar radiation modification technologies. And here you see why I asked the question, because there is always this association in the broader public out there that SRM, solar radiation modification, means sol uh, stratospheric aerosol injection, which is actually... How do you do this? Ah, that's, ah, it's like shooting. I'm sorry. Um, okay, yeah. It's, the, it's this part of the exercise. But there are many more technologies. And again, let me know, not get into it because there will be avenues for you to find and talk about this. So what, what I mentioned before, and so what we do is we are trying to do, uh, produce like um, uh, knowledge products which help people enter, uh, enter the, um, the, the space we are talking about. And our, our target groups are, um, to a large extent, senior level um, uh, officials either in government, we're talking minister, vice minister, and their support staff, or we're talking about international organizations. Here we talk about the head of the organization and, um, and the people in charge of the subject matter or related subject matters, but also the, the next level of expertise and, and the science supporting. So we, 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 last year, for example, we said, okay, uh, why do we need governance around these things? We are going to get the uh, interface between sustainable development objectives and, um, and, uh, and these various technologies. So how does it look like? What do we know about uh, one technology and its interrelations to, the, um, to one uh, uh, sustainable development goal? And similarly, the question, if I'm in charge of a sustainable development goal, what are the technologies which I have to be, you know, get onto my radar screen if I want to drive those? And this is just an extract and you can't read about it, but basically, Red dot means that there are risks identified, and anything which is gray means there are research gaps. And there's a lot. So um, it's one product. And so what, what are we doing is this, um, as, as um, Andy was mentioning, we are trying to basically, our, our philosophy of change fundamentally is get these issue of governance for these technologies on agendas for in, of international processes and organizations. The rationale is once governments have accept, accepted to put it on their agenda, then the whole process of bringing in the civil societies, bringing in the science, uh, science support, et cetera, et cetera, is taking place. It's a bit of a, so that's basically the fundamental theory of change. And so we're trying to kind of work on all these dimensions of it and in different uh, processes. And these are just examples of uh, where we're operating. I'm sure you have heard about um, uh, the Un United Nations Environment Assembly, I think. Um, I've got um, you heard this morning about this. Yeah, Marcus, yeah, sorry, Marcus. Um, uh, heard about it, and I can explain that. I will use as an example as how we have been operating. Uh, but we have also worked with um, the Convention of Bio Biodiversity um, and IPCC. But let me go to the UN Environment Assembly as an example. So as an organization, what we are doing is we are going into meetings or into places where our representatives to processes are going to meet and talk. And we are providing technical briefings. We bring in people, I'm not so sure we brought you in ND, but we work with ND to find the experts to bring in um, uh, in order to make like a technical briefing and a policy briefing and so forth. And then say, go back and find out what you would like to do about this. And so, for example, on the United Nations environment, we, in 2017, we reached out to the United Nations environment program and to the head of the program and present him the, uh, the issues and, 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 and the problem. The problem. And we got the buy-in basically from the head of the organization. That's an issue which he believes United Nations Environment Program is perfectly fit to actually look at. It's an emerging issue. That's the mandate of UNEP. It has to look into emerging issues and provide information and knowledge to, uh, 
to uh, their, their, their governments and their parties. Okay, so once we had agreed with that, um, but they also are subject as, they need a mandate. I think you might have mentioned this on the IAI as well. They need a mandate. So what we discussed and agreed is that we will come in and uh, take, make briefings in Nairobi for government representatives. First time we come, there are about 30, 40 government representatives. We organize a briefing, webcast, so that anyone can participate. And then we have bilateral meetings with the uh, permanent representatives. And thinking, bring to the subject and say, you know, and, and getting a sense of what the issues are. And the typical reactions we got is, I don't know what this is. Who does work on this? Where's the information? So the obvious point was, is, well, you have an organization. Its job is to bring the information together and give it to you. Um, and that happened in May last year, the last briefing we did. And after that, one, one government decided we believe in this and we're going to put this as a proposal to the United Nations Assembly, a resolution. At this point, we have to step back as an organization because we do not want to be associated with the content of the text. That's not our problem. But we keep continuing in parallel to provide briefings to governments, uh, bilateral meetings, and so forth. So, so we either go into the process, brief the crowd as a whole, or we go into the country. For example, we came to Brazil about a year ago, yeah, a bit more than a year ago. Uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Climate Change um, invited us. And then we saw all the ministries, did the briefings, did the talks. A result was that definitely Brazil back then said, well, it's an issue we cannot avoid talking about anymore, so we have to get into it. And, and, and then think about how to best deal with this. Because there's the avenue of UNEA, but there's also the avenue of the United Nations General Assembly. People will argue that uh, because solar radiation modification, it's nature, it's not something for the UNFCCC convention, it's not something for UNEP, which is you know, policy and information organization, it's a program, is actually something which has such serious impacts um, or such challenges in governance that it's a matter for the General Assembly and the Security Council. Yeah, I, I'm not sure whether you touched on the, the challenges of governance for SRM, but who decides the temperature level? What's happening if uh, you know, a drought suddenly happens while this uh, program is run? All these kind of questions. Or even the first question, do we want to go further with this? So that's basically what, uh, what we do in, in, in the intergovernmental processes. We, we have basically, um, our, our, our principle is to say, look what governance exists and identify a gap. So you have heard, I'm sure, this morning about the Biodiversity Convention in, uh, uh, that they have a decision about geoengineering. But it's a decision, first of all, the, the governments which are forming the biodiversity are not all, and the major one is missing. And the um, decision itself is not legally extremely binding. I mean, I, I could not tell my kid saying, you will be protected against somebody running SRM on the basis of this, uh, of this um, um, decision of the CBD. But it has a useful element. It had an element is that, that they said, we, we, we cannot do anything. We, we should not do this because we do not know enough about it and encouraged more transdisciplinary research. We said, okay, fine. So we went to the secretariat of the CBD, talked to the head of the uh, secretariat, and said, look, you have this decision. What can we do? We are happy to facilitate a process where you bring in your government representatives, and we're going to elaborate what is it that you think should be further, and create a document and input into the, into the CBD process. So as you see, we are kind of, um, stealth is the wrong word, but we are kind of uh, opportunistic, finding the right moment and the right opportunity, and then our strength, I would argue, is that we have the access to senior level government representatives or uh, UN body um, representatives, whether they are global or whether they're regional. Let's bring it to the region. Uh, we have, okay, we had interactions bilaterally with, uh, with Brazil, with Chile, and um, uh, Colombia, and not that many. Right? We, are, we are 10 people, but we run around the globe in that sense, or work around the globe. So what we did is, is we, um, um, we talked, um, we approached in each of the global regions, we approached the regional body of the United Nations, which is the Economic and Social Commissions of uh, the region. Here it sits in Santiago, CEPAL, I'm sure you're aware of that. And uh, again, we talked to the head of the organization and said, what can we do? And so we identified that the, um, that the good opportunity to talk about this would be the, um, it just took place, the, um, the, the regional meeting um, on the Sustainable Development Goals, which took place in, in, in Santiago. I think last month or something like that, uh, and, and do the same thing, make a presentation, present models like NROLs and, and other the tools which you can demonstrate in 
what kind of policy levers you have in order to achieve the, the goals, uh, where basically the conclusion is you will not achieve it unless you do large-scale removals. Uh, what a surprise. Um, but I mean, when uh, a side event and follow-up of that, it's, it's, we have to see still what is the follow-up of that. Um, but so we have worked with the, with the regional commission, so there are opportunities to, to have new ideas. We are working with, um, in the region as well with something which is called the Low Emission Development Strategy Partnership, um, which is a global partnership which has a regional um, outreach, so to say. And let me just check. Yeah. Uh -huh. That's what I was going to present in the first place. So we, one of these papers, so I mentioned the paper, so I mentioned the paper of sustainable development. We have done a paper where we said, um, well, if you look at large-scale removals, that's mainly a, a matter uh, which is already a lot of regulation. It's a bit fragmented all over the place, but there is an anchor and a mandate in UNFCCC to do it. So we worked with um, um, a group of experts um, and, uh, and, the, and the think tank Climate Analytics to look at what is out there are we ready to do large scale in terms of a governance perspective to basically identify the gaps of governance because why reinvent something if you have existing elements? So there's a paper out there which, 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 which provides a basis and can help to provoke uh, conversations. We also did um, uh, prepare the paper together with a number of experts from various regions in Brazil. I think it was Carlos Nobles. And um, we, uh, we produced this paper here, which is um, about the need for governance, which basically looks, about, uh, looks at, uh, as it says, uh, what is engineering, um, why does it need governing, what's the current status of governance, uh, who is involved, who is working on this around the globe, uh, which is, as Andy was describing, kind of uh, unbalanced in one direction. Um, and then what could be possible next steps of governance. So, so that's the kind of things which we are doing. Um, and... Um, I mean, it's, it's a big fight. Um, we do see that there's a success. I wanted to come back to UNEA. That's, uh, sorry, I lost my... Sorry. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the, um, so at UNEA, so we triggered that Switzerland decided to go ahead. Maybe it's a good thing to end, because it gives hope uh, that it works. Um, so there was Switzerland which took the, the initiative. It reached out to a number of countries. It found like 10 to 11 countries, which represented small countries, medium-sized countries, adva middle advanced economies, um, uh, about 10 African, Asian, and Latin American countries. Here it was Mexico and another country which I forgot. Um, they basically tabled a resolution which was, you know, one has views around it, that doesn't matter. But they tabled a resolution which fundamentally was saying, well, let's agree that we are going to establish basically a knowledge base around these two big buckets of technologies with a view to see what governance is required. I'm paraphrasing it. If you read the text which was presented initially, it was probably much stronger and scared a number of people away. And so they tabled it, and uh, it ended up in... Uh, uh, initially, people thought this is going to be a small little resolution. It's going to happen on the side. It ended up to be one of the most fought and discussed um, uh, resolutions in Nairobi. And the faith of it was that it was withdrawn. This one couldn't come to a conclusion, which from our initiative perfect, because you have done your first step of governance at this level, which is somebody said, well, it's an issue. Others have said, no, it's not an issue. And the story is not over, because it's not from the, from the table. There was not a decision which says, it's not an issue. It was a uh, discussion where governments have different views. And I think that's an important aspect to, uh, to, to understand. And we have countries which, are, which have said already, even in the closing remarks, this is not the end of it. We're going to go in this organization and other organizations we're going to move forward on this. Um, and, and the others which were kind of on the other side of the fence in terms of not wanting to have a resolution, they were able to say why and why not, which, which provides the opportunity to move forward. But I think everyone to some extent agreed is that we do not know enough. And I think majority agree that when we have to take or going to hit the decision point, we will not know enough to make our judgments at this point in time. So there needs to be a proactive effort like Andy is doing and others are doing, Paulo, you're doing here in, in Brazil and in, in, in the continent, is to create that mass of people which begins to, um, to focus on it. Because we always say 2050, that's 30 years. Born today, you're, <clears throat> born today, you're 30, right? If you're coming out of you know, 10, 10 class, you will be in the mid prime of your, of your uh, human activity. Or, and then I think we have, a, we have a big responsibility here to get this thing off the ground. 
Thank you. And apology, again, my, my, my slides, I have all the detail behind, so in case you want the detail, I have left the text below, read it, and anytime send us a message to um, C2G2. And as I said, we have taken out geoengineering for the reason, um, as I explained, but there's a nice blog on our website. <laughs> Thank you, Kai, for this nice presentation. I wanted to uh, publicly apologize for all the things happening to you yesterday here. So, uh, discussion, points? Yes, one point is, uh, in the 90s, we, we had in, in the Andean countries many different forums organized by the Center for Sustainable, for the Andean Center for Sustainable Development at that time. We organized at least three forums, one in Lima, another in Bogota, another in Caracas, related with the, what is called today the biosafety protocol. Uh -huh. you know, the protocol of the Bioseguridad de la Convención de, de, de Biodiversidad. At that time, is, I think that there are many similarities, because at that time, the interest of the developing countries was was just to try to assess the risk of GMOs. And, uh, and I, I see so many similarities to uh, I see that this, there is a quite a lot of learning in that particular process of negotiation of that protocol. Uh, because I think, and there are very, very many interesting books on that particular matter, you know, because really the biosafety uh, protocol was an initiative of the developing countries uh, because the, the, the preoccupation of different risks associated with GMOs. So I think that there is quite a lot of learning there. Um, thank you. I think you make a very good point, and I didn't emphasize this in this presentation because I put my slide um, up very quickly. But we are also uh, moving in our in our kind of uh, messaging. It is that. It is actually a matter of governance of emerging technologies. And that's the, the biggest similarity in, across all of these. These are technologies which go to the kind of border of what we understand and what we know. And we have to take decisions as to whether to use them and not. And uh, so I think there's a lot of similarity. And uh, in terms of I mean, just on, on removals, for example, people think that's, I mean, we hear a lot about nature-based systems which can do it or not. But in terms of governance perspective, what you refer to GMO, there are, there are studies and work out there to increase the uh, content of plants, for example, just for the purpose of capturing more. This incremental capturing would make the in impact on, 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 on the overall, yeah. But I mean, thank you. I, I will try to also find out maybe afterwards too. Steve. Okay, uh, great presentation. Two questions. One is, could you summarize briefly what is, what is the map according to your knowledge or your organization knowledge about the geoengineering, geoengineering uh, research initiatives in the world? I mean, what are the 10 countries that have more uh, initiatives in research? And the second question is, you say you are, you, start to, you are starting or started just before not to use anymore the word geoengineering. Okay. Yeah, and I can explain why. Okay. Uh, on the first one, I will probably, uh, I don't, my memory kind of, um, um, I think you de he described it roughly where, where the centers of research are. Um, and I have a little bit, in, in, the, in the slides which are in my, there's, uh, I could try to find it, there is, there is uh, that paper has done an analysis of where they are. And maybe Andy can help with that question. Um, because I don't claim to know things which I don't know. And then the second is uh, about, about the, uh, the geoengineering, why we are not, it's not that we are, we, we will use it. But what we have found is that if I'm going to, uh, let's say, uh, no, he, he's okay. <laughs> I go to a person and say, let's talk about geoengineering. The average, even policymaker, has heard some sound bites which are either uh, uh, news-based, fake news-based, or whatever based. And they have like, um, they have a reaction, oh no, geoengineering, my God, no, 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 this is way too hard. But if one go goes to them and says, look, we have a problem, you have the, the challenge of remove a lot, large scale, and if case you don't make enough removal, you have the risk of uh, you know, temperature overshoot, and people are thinking about things such as solar radiation modification. It gives a complete different entry point because the person doesn't, doesn't block right away. And that's why we're trying to, in all our communication now to go, uh, we will probably attract much less people into a room if we don't use the title geoengineering because it also has a certain attractiveness. But in terms of uh, conversations which try to move 
and bring people into into the subject matter, not and then and then form their opinion on their own. Uh, we feel it's uh, it's helpful uh, to not use the term geoengineering, but then clearly say these technologies have the characteristics of what is the definition of geoengineering. IPCC did the same thing fundamentally in the IPCC 1.5 report. They have stripped completely the, the, uh, the text uh, of IPCC report from geoengineering, and only in the glossary they basically say the uh, that these two baskets are, uh, are geoengineering, for, I think for similar reasons. Okay. Uh, Hassan. Uh, quem descobriu que precisa... Que é pre Deixa quem, o fone. Deixa quem, o fone. quem descobriu que é preciso modificar a radiação solar? Por que isso? Yeah, his question is, who find out why we should change the solar radiation budget? And the idea. Yeah, okay, okay. I, I, can, uh, I can answer. Yeah, why don't you answer it? Because <laughs> I, I have a, a different aspect. Sim, o que, o que o homem está mudando, na verdade, além de aumentar a concentração de gás de efeito estufa, é o que a gente chama balanço de radiação solar. Nós estamos adicionando 2,6 watts por metro ao quadrado por causa do aumento da concentração dos gases de efeito estufa. Se você reduzir o fluxo de radiação solar em 2,6 watts por metro ao quadrado, em teoria o sistema retorna ao equilíbrio. Por isso é que é chamado Solar Radiation Management. É alteração no fluxo de radiação solar para restaurar o clima que nós tivemos. Havia sido aumentado. Não, por causa do aumento da concentração dos gases de efeito estufa. Eu te explico depois. Vamos lá. Tem mais uma pergunta aí? Eu te explico daqui a pouco. Boa tarde. Uh, sou Edgar Faria. Estou a estudar o doutoramento na UFRJ. E sou moçambicano. Se calhar, posso ser, talvez posso representar toda a África aqui. Porque estou a ver que sou o único africano aqui. Acabou me tocando e achei que tinha, que tinha que falar alguma coisa acerca disso. Eu vejo esse, 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 esse assunto de mudança climática como sendo um assunto muito complicado para, para gerir, principalmente para os países pobres. Né? pobres. Eu, no, na verdade... É, quero aproveitar nesse momento para fazer uma questão. Não sei se será ela a responder ou serão os nossos cientistas que estão aí em frente podem partilhar a ideia de como me responder. Porque é, não sei se a representação lá nessas convenções fazem parte a, a esses países como o meu, como o meu caso que também tentam discutir assuntos relativos aos países pobres, como Moçambique, nesse caso. Porque, uh, em termos de emissão de gases de, de efeito de estufa, já é sabido que os países desenvolvidos, aqueles que estão uh, acima do poder, eles não querem uh, praticamente desistir daquilo que é o, a sua emissão, porque realmente a economia depende dessa... De, 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 de várias indústrias em que esses países estão inseridos. E, com isso tudo, como os efeitos são globais, esses efeitos acabam atingindo aqueles países, não digamos que não emitem, porque também existe, lá nesses países, existe desmatamento, existem outras formas de emissão, mas se calhar em, em menor proporção, né? Mas os efeitos acabam sendo alarmantes. Né? Vou diretamente, vejo que vai me cortar, porque estou a ver a querer me cortar. Vou diretamente no assunto de Moçambique. Isso. Há, 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 se calhar há, há dois meses atrás, houveram dois ciclones consecutivos em Moçambique, não sei se acompanharam, o Idai, tanto como o Kenneth. E foram eventos atípicos. 
um deles uh, destruiu a segunda maior cidade da, do, do, do país. Não é? uhum. E as consequências foram muito alarmantes. Tiveram que haver apoio, que o próprio Brasil até ajudou, algumas, alguns outros países ajudaram. Então, isso nos preocupa, nos preocupa muito, porque, na verdade, nós podemos discutir aqui, falarmos sobre esse assunto, mas acaba, acabamos ficando sempre nós sem o desfecho do, do, do assunto. E eu não sei se existe uma contraparte desses países que emitem eh, grandes quantidades para com os países pobres. Não sei se existe essa contraparte. Ou, talvez, acabam ficando na ética, como vi, que acaba virando moda, né? não sei se... Então, isso nos preocupa, nós, como países pobres, nesse momento, né? porque os eventos estão sendo já frequentes. Né? Ok, muito obrigado e agradeço pelo simpósio. Um, I thank you for your intervention. I'm happy that someone from the continent is over here. Uh, and I think you point to an important factor, which is that uh, there is a challenge for these countries to be represented and make their case in, in the negotiations and get their just um, uh, input into it. Um, and I think activities such as that of Andy are trying to kind of counter that because often the situation is, is that the ability to, as you said, the ability to provide your negotiators with the ammunition to make your points uh, is, 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 is lacking. They cannot turn around and trust, right? So that's, I think, an, an important factor. And so, and I would like to actually, Andy, to also react to that question about where our science is taking place right now. Uh, but you're pointing to a very fundamental problem, which is in that convention since its very, 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 very beginning. Who pays for what needs to be done? In addition to what you need to do. The big step of Paris is, I mean, in terms of the Paris Agreement, the big step is that all countries have said, we do something. We do it to the best of our abilities, and we're trying to, each time we come together, which is going to be 2020 or 2021, we go, we're going to come with saying, this is how we're going to do more. But we all know it's not going to be that easy without the financial um, resources to actually undertake it. And it's not only finance, it's the ability to make your judgment call as to what is it that you want and how do you want to apply it. Take the example, SRM is one discussion, you will be impacted unfairly in any case. Uh, take the large scale removal. I'm not necessarily convinced that all these technologies would necessarily be something for, of which the continent of Africa cannot benefit. There might be technologies which you could develop and lay out and provide a service to the global community of removing. But you point to the right question. For this, there needs to be the readiness that somebody wants to pay. And these are these govern governance questions which are going to basically come back and even bigger in the context of, of, of where we are right now. But these are long-standing uh, issues which, which are there and they will be resolved the way politics are being resolved at this point in time. All we can do is get people as early as possible in the conversation and our efforts we try to kind of act at the same time in all places, but actually we focused a lot in Africa because of uh, the UNEA and did then side things like with, with countries. But a very interesting comment there was is that the majority of those who said, let's get engaged, as he says, this is again an opportunity where it's the train has not left the station yet. We can jump on, we can try to get the knowledge, and we can try to be able to influence the decision-making governance with our, pers our understanding rather than an understanding which is told us to us by somebody else. But if Andy could quickly react to that distribution of the research. Yeah, I, I just wanted to bring to your attention, Eduardo, you asked about where research is taking place in the world right now. There was a great blog post. So the Harvard Solar Geoengineering Research Program, they've, they've got a blog on solar geoengineering, and I'm one of the editors for the blog. On November the 13th of last year, there was a blog post about funding for solar geoengineering research in the last decade around the world. And a researcher meticulously went through, and for ev everywhere from you know the, the decimals grants to um, to Harvard's research program itself. So that's a great pl place to start, 13th of November 2018. Good, okay, thank you, Kai. So, oh. I, I had uh, uh, two questions. First of all, because at the Earth, the summit in Nairobi, this resolution to even do research was blocked by three countries, and they apparently don't want to know 
even anything about it, let alone do it. Uh, isn't that a real, how are you gonna do governance if you can't even get that done? And the second question is, changing terminology is very difficult. We, I see huge posters, geoengineering, 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 here, and you wanna, and you wanna not use it anymore. Uh, they, they tried to change it to climate engineering, to climate intervention, but still people use the term geoengineering. I noticed you tried to change SRM to solar radiation modification instead of solar radiation management. And, and some people call it sunlight reduction methods. So I think, unfortunately, we may be stuck with these terms that everybody recognizes, even if you want to change it. Um, to be clear, I don't, uh, first of all, let me react to the last one. We don't want to change it. We said for use, using it to bring people into the discussion of rearm, given the, uh, given the unclarity or emotions associated with it, is not helpful. I said to bring you into the conversation, I use something which is less or controversial, okay? And then explain the history of it. Um, so that's one. Uh, and uh, the first question was about, oh yeah, um, no. If you can't get them, if you can't oh yeah, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, it is, it is quite, uh, well, some of the governments who were there, and, and let's be, uh, one thing I want to also say, so we were in Nairobi, it's a two weeks conference, and after five days into the conference, we were like a team of uh, four, four people who had foreseen doing s workshops, uh, some capacity building events and whatever. Um, we had foreseen to have a booth there for information purposes. We decided to fold up, fly back, and forgo the cost. Why? Because we were, we were becoming uh, associated through rumors and backdoors as people trying to influence the decision content. And that's definitely not our purpose, and that's why we moved out. Um, but still, we have been following what was happening. It says, so governments did not necessarily say, we don't want to know. But they were more sophisticated, saying, there is a process going on, which is trying to do that, IPCC. Um, so why don't you, why let's, let's wait what IPCC is going to bring. But IPCC, okay, I mean, if you know IPCC, IPCC is a, well, you know. But IPCC captures the existing knowledge. So it is not necessarily about identifying questions people want to answer, making people aware of it so that when they see the information, they can react, which, which was basically the underlying, and, and create a level playing field around the world, which everyone can trust in, as long as we trust international organizations such as the UN that I can trust that a person from Mozambique can read and say, well, this was produced by UN, at least I should be uh, okay if I follow that link, that this link is, call it kosher. Um, so there is, th there is this, I think, that, that element. And um, I wanted to say one more thing, uh, but it's coming back. Just a word. I should remember that in, in the 90s, <laughs> we were talking about genetic engineering. And during the negotiations, the name was changed to genetic modi modified organism. Ah, yeah. if, if I may, I just wanted to, um, so what, in terms of the terminology, I mean, we as, as our organization, we're trying to always use, as much as we can, internationally agreed terminology, and solar radiation modification was something which was introduced by the IPCC. Okay. Can, um, I, can I just ask you a very quick technical question? It's a doubt. Uh, solar radiation monitoring programs like those that I'm listening here, does it uh, consider that the CO2 level in the atmosphere still continues the same concentration, right? So this doesn't change the problem of ocean acidification, right? That's the, the question that I want to make. Yeah. So uh, if I understand your co question correctly, is that SRM is not going to resolve our problem. Right? It is, it is, it's like a, you know, a fever, you take a, or you have pain, you take an um, Advil. It just lowers your, your, your pain level. If you don't fight the, uh, the virus, it's not. And it, it might actually have, yeah. And that's why it's so important to have that. Uh, it's, it's it, may, it's a it, it, it may do ocean acidification actually worse. On the top of it. But that's another business. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so <laughs> after a long two days of discussion, we came here to a closing. So thank you, Kai. Pedro. So basically, so basically, what are the next steps? First is, of course, to properly make a report from our meeting. We will try to make a synthesis of all these subjects that were discussed. 
uh, ev all the d discussions were also recorded. They will be available in the Brazilian Academy of Science website, including all the discussions, not just the presentations. And then the next step is actually one of the objectives that come up from this discussion is to make the public more aware of what's going on, uh, needs for research at least, the dangers that we have in both the governance and also on the science and so on. In order to do that, you know, uh, there are several ways that we're gonna try to do. So we're discussing with the director of the IEI, the Inter-American Institute for Climate Research. So they will try to strongly disseminate this uh, document and also the issue for Latin, America, uh, uh, Latin American countries. Also, uh, the Brazilian Academy of Science is part of the Inter-Academy Panel, that is a consortium of many, many different Academy of Science, especially in the developing world. We have a close partnership, especially with the South Africa, China, the developing world academies. And then we also push these documents and this discussion to that direction. And then let's hope that the end the new initiative on the new decimals. We started to also model in a consortium of Amazonian countries, you know, not just Brazil, you know, we could submit a good proposal to really start to uh, study the effects of such techniques to the Amazonian forest in Latin America, not just in Brazil. So there are a lot of initiatives that came, came out from this uh, initiative that also includes uh, enhancement carbon capture and storage techniques that according to the IPCC report will be absolutely necessary, otherwise we'll be fried uh, very soon. So basically this is some of the initiatives we're gonna start uh, almost immediately of this. And then, Pedro. Yeah, I think uh, another initiative more local that we've been discussing is uh, more uh, let's say a strategic approach to uh, funding agencies uh, here in Brazil. That's what I mean by local. Uh, uh, to call the attention for the importance of this uh, 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 of geoengineering, uh, not just from the point of view of st strictly from the point scientific point of view, but also from the, uh, the point of view of governance, and that's the reason why in the organization of this event, we uh, split the subject in two different uh, uh, days. Uh, and uh, another point that um, we've been discussing is uh, I've been asking uh, coordinators of uh, graduate programs in different universities here in Brazil in climate sciences about geoengineering. And uh, I was really amazed to see uh, the general reaction. Um, some people don't even know exactly what it is, and some people have a very negative reaction. And I'm not talking about the general public. I mean, I'm talking about people who are involved in, the, in managing uh, graduate programs in, in atmospheric sciences. Um, so um, we're we have this clear notion that uh, we also have to be much more proactive in uh, interacting with the graduate programs in order to, um, to, to have more uh, students involved in this uh, uh, theme uh, from a research point of view. Um, so far, um, I would say that uh, at least uh, um, in our environment at the University of São Paulo, uh, uh, we had some success in the sense that uh, um, the, in the recent uh, document, uh, uh, strategic planning for uh, our program, uh, this topic is in the strategic program for the next five years. Um, the success, I mean, uh, this, it means that we have to work really hard. Actually, this meeting is already part of this process in the sense of uh, spreading the, the knowledge 
and uh, and uh, also uh, something that I think you didn't mention is the possibility of uh, uh, our intention to uh, take this uh, issue to science and technology. Uh,